much, Mark. My name is Andy Beal, and I'm the chief scientist at WorldViz here in Santa Barbara. And absolutely pleasure to be here today. Um, uh, I've known Mark, uh, you for a number of years now. Um, we cross paths in different ways of uh, virtual reality, and looking forward to kind of chatting about um, what I mean by breaking reality. That's. I want to start right there with. Uh, the title of this is Breaking Reality, the Emotional Impact of VR. When you suggested that as the title, I, I fell in love with it. Why don't you unpack that a little bit for the audience? Yeah, well, I, I'd like to kind of posit that breaking reality is often a goal of mine with using VR. Because you can kind of get in this bit of a rat race of striving to make the better and better technology and, and kind of you know focus on, on the pixels. Whereas if you focus on even what a fairly crude form of VR can do in terms of taking you to maybe a different mental state, a different mm. state of, of consciousness, if you want to get a little grandiose with it, um, you realize that, I would say, A, the, the technology in an imperfect form is incredibly powerful and useful scientifically um, in many practical applications. And B, I find it a fascinating way to start to unpack really the question of what is what is reality? What 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 is the the world and the reality that we live in day to day. And that, that gives deep core philosoph philosophical discussions, which I'm, I don't have the degree to go too far on, but, but I like to kind of um, uh, rub, rub uh, shoulders with it. So. Well, I remember when you were working at UCSB, you invited me out. It was during my days uh, in the early days of Wavefront when computer graphics yep. was just getting started. How was it that you were introduced to VR? Cause you, you're, one of the pioneers in the very early days, but from the point of view of in the psych department, right? You were, you yeah, were yeah, looking at that. Department. Yeah, tell yeah, us so, about that. Yeah, so first off, uh, the psych department can be all sorts of different things. So for me, it was uh, the next step of, of cognitive science. And back in the, the mid 90s, my, my passion prior to that had been artificial intelligence, but AI in the late 80s, 90s, basically amounted to chess playing. And I was far more fascinated with what like animals and humans can do in the natural world. And that was like, you know, animals flying, humans driving cars. So VR and the promise of VR, and, and I'll, I'll say that before I started to hit my head against trying to build a practical form of VR, which I'll, I'll mention just in a sec, there was an article, uh, like a treatise by a fellow named Jaron Lanier, considered one sure, of those sort of of course. VR. Sure, sure, um, sure. And making a premise of what would it like to be a lobster? And that kind of out there premise of what if you could remap your senses? What if you could remap your motor system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and experience that? And just, um, so th there's a famous sort of philosophical paper by Thomas Nagel, what is it like to be a bat? And so to me, right. that was going from a like a very uh, complex sort of notion of consciousness and, and other, other beings mm -hmm. to something practical that I could do with, uh, you know, Python code and, and a headset. And so to get my hands on a headset as a psychology um, uh, student was like zero possibility because of the budgets and, and typical psych departments. But um, by just sort of persevering, buying some Sony Watchmen TV, so that's how far back this is, yeah. um, taking them apart, mounting them on scuba glasses, scuba goggles, um, building up kind of a very sort of, uh, you know, uh, nuts and bolts VR system, all of a sudden, um, even with a with a resolution that was beyond legally blind, I was able to start to perform meaningful, interesting tasks by interacting with with virtual sort of uh, real world objects. So, it was during those days I've told this story to friends often. My first experience with VR was in your lab. Why don't you uh, tell our listeners what you tricked me into doing? <laughs> yeah, so uh, so that's how far back the walk the plane demo goes. So yep. early 90s, um, running off of literally um, a, a early, early uh, silicon graphics machine. And we couldn't afford the fancy frame grabber converter that would go to NTSC video. So we literally took two um, uh, handy cam uh, uh, video recorders, mounted them in front of the fancy monitor, pumped them into the headset. And the world was black and white checkerboard. There was no um, fancy uh, texture mapping back then. And yet the effect as, as you put on those glasses and, you know, yes, there was a suspension of disbelief that this isn't, this wasn't passing like a, 
like an environmental Turing test that looked artificial. And yet a visual cliff is you start to walk forward and you would see a precipice, you'd see like a three meter drop off. It triggered a, you know, a, a handy response that we all hopefully have and that's to not step off, you know, the, the cliff, so. <laughs> that, that persists um, to this day as a, a very, very strong memory. And yet now, in as we come into 2023, and you know, Facebook co-opted the word meta, and we have this thing called the metaverse, and it's kind of everybody is talking about it. You're in the trenches, actually delivering this in practical applications. Give us an example of what's really happening now, and not what the promise of VR is. Yeah, yeah. Um just to capture on what you just kind of ended with it was that lasting memory right and yes that that that's in some ways the essence of what i think vr can do so it's so different than looking at a monitor when you when you have when you have a headset on no matter no matter the quality of that headset what it really is doing to you is giving you the experience of being there it's it's a being that being in being there experience that because it's not just glancing at a at a 2D image and, and seeing it as something on the outside, that memory is is three dimensional. It's experiential and it, it burns into your your psyche in a way and, and lasts. And and um, that fact, that that element of power with VR, I would say, is kind of the thread that goes to everything that we have kind of continued to do with it, and that's mm. isolate. When is the situation that that a user has an application where that that level of um, presence and, and coherence and situational awareness is going to be the essence of of, of taking a, a whether it's a scientific study, I work with a lot of scientists using this, or whether it's a an instructor trying to train a medical or a nursing student on on how to stay focused in the situation of all sorts of external cues that might be going off in the in the virtual but immediate background it's it's um it's the fact that that thread cuts through um the really the the artificial senses of of, of what it's like to watch things on on a monitor you you're in that and that's what that's what delivers and it doesn't have to it doesn't have to have the the level of of visual reality as you see in a Hollywood movie, and that bar keeps moving. And as you pointed out, 30 years ago, crude graphics was enough to give you a very interesting reaction. And the same keeps happening despite the, you know, the ever increasing graphical fidelity. So uh, uh, not a famous quote, but a quote by a computer scientist, Andy Van Dam is, VR doesn't stand for visual reality. So it's, you know, it, it doesn't alone depend on the visual. So the fidelity of the imagery doesn't necessarily impact the cognitive power of the tool. Imagery is just one element. So it, it's it. really, to me, it's, it's, it's a storytelling tool. And uh -huh. you can either tell a good story or a bad story. And you can use multimodality in that storytelling. Or, you know, you can throw it all into, uh, you know, one sense. But... Um, are you conveying something that's touching the person that's, you know, receiving that story? And that's to me what it many, many ways boils down to. Your work is in, in what you help, you're helping um, neuroscientists and psychologists. That's the main, the main body of your work. Now, give us some examples of, of things they're studying, if you can. Sure. Yeah. So, um, all right, so an example of like a neuroscientist. Um, uh, I, I've got a, um, I have a stimulus here. I'm sorry, uh, surrounded by, yeah, here. Tell, so, tell, us, tell us what you're doing because oh, that room this is-, is a, This is a form of projection VR, okay? Okay. I'm in a, I'm in a theater surrounded um, by a, a fancy ultra short throw projectors and I, I can interact with the walls. And this is a way to, to tap into 360 video. And this is, this is just a 360 recording. And so it, it's actually in, in, in this full scene. And, okay. and I brought this one up in particular in, to your question about a neuroscientist. If I have some vestibular disorders, balance disorders, and yes. I'm 
facing a visual stimulus of this sort, I'm going to be able to isolate a portion of the person's brain, if you will, and be able to detect where that disorder may be happening. So oh. crude way of saying you know, um, that, but there's a level of being able to um, use VR as a microscope into oh. the functionality of really the, the mind that has an underpinning of the brain that, that's gonna be similar to what you might gain with the fMRI. And in many ways, in my opinion, in many ways can still be superior to an fMRI because I'm coming at it at a very functional level. I'm able to isolate based on my experience rather than ground up from what the hemoglobin is resonating and trying to tell me about what various neural pathways might be doing. So I'm thinking of, I, I instantly thought of fMRI because I'm, I'm locked down in that situation, right? As the patient, the under study. And here, if part of it is mobility, I'm trying to understand, as you said, stability and things like that. The fact that I can move and I don't have a, a monitor on my head, all of that stuff, I have my natural body motion. I'm sure that unlocks um, part of the experiment for them. Right, right. So, you know, just from, a, again, get back to like a technology point of view, um, VR doesn't have to be driven by a headset. Headsets have its problems. It can be driven by projection. Projection has its problems. These are all, you know, imperfect technologies to achieve, you know, back to use that story, uh, storytelling. In the case of like a neuroscientist, what you need to do is, you um, provide a little preamble. So standard practice in using VR for treatment conditions is to, to um, not expose necessarily the hardware. You might have the person come in with the room lights darkened so that mm. they don't know limitations of what the virtual world might mm. be. So much mm. like when you go into a theater, you know, it's darkened and, and your imagination can sort of unfold a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's a really important attribute when you're using VR with, uh, with human subjects allow the possibilities to remain and so you know, that we don't trigger any of our audience maybe you can put that back <laughs> to the uh the i love how you just touched that and have must be fun to watch football in that room uh <laughs> so I, I, I you remind me of some friends we it seems to be a, a current comp, uh, conversation around vr uh, where i had two friends that went to something in denver they did some kind of immersive vr deal and they were phys physically sick for about 24 hours and then disoriented for two or three days. W what is it about VR that affects people? I'm kind of going to the emotional impact, but it felt like there was, he felt emotional, but there was a physical aspect. What, what, what's happening there, Doc? Um, there are cases of, of um, well, certain, first off, could be nausea. Okay, it was, VR is super easy to make people super sick okay if, if oh. you just kind of and, and today the technology and the hardware is makes it harder to be able to do that um but latency and bad frame rates are ways to um, you know make somebody sick really quickly so it could be at that level but there are also known cases of basically flashback simulator flashback What's and these that? have been known all the way back from the flight simulator days so VR's sort of, you know, ancestry is related to original flight simulation. Right, right. And um, there have been cases of somebody having, you know, pilot having flashbacks suddenly, say, while driving, needing to pull over because they might be feeling like they're suddenly doing a barrel roll. Now, wow. now I say that that's extremely rare. Um, in my experience, probably having done um, human subjects work on over 10,000 subjects back in my research days. Um, I maybe had one yeah. claim that was possibly related to that. So I think if if you as a practitioner are being careful on on how you're building the environments, um, it's that type of scenario. I, I'd love to know more about. I guess what did happen to your friends, but but um, you know, I mean, it, it, exposures to virtual environments like the one you had walking across that pit decades ago is leaving an imprint. I mean that that's. Yeah. That's that's the truth of it. That's the power of it. And it can also be the danger of it. I mean, there are, are going to be, I think, burgeoning ethical questions with the power of that VR thread that I can kind of run through a story and, and make you experience something that maybe you hadn't you know, signed up for. Right. Um, yeah. So that's certainly a possibility. I, I'm thinking about how 
you were at the very early days, the early, early days. I mean, I remember at SGI, we wrote VM VRML before anybody like what didn't even know what HTML was back in the day. Sorry to get nerdy on my audience, <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking that now the general public has heard about virtual reality and the metaverse and more and more and more yet. So to them, it feels like the early days. Are we at the early middle or still in the early days or where do you think we are in the, the adoption uh, of these technologies? Yeah. Uh, you want me to be the fortune teller? Uh, I think we're still at kind of the, I think we're, I think with the recent headset advances that are making these mm. close to what we think of as being a smartphone. And I think mm. that's important. We, we need these headsets to not be burdened by the problems of like the whole PC industry of drivers and cables and all that, right? It needs to be as easy to pull out of your, uh, your pocket and, and do a, do a, a Zoom call. Okay. Um, they're right on the verge of that. And then I think we're going to start a more traditional sort of adoption curve um, when when the, the friction of usage is, is super low. I, I don't think, um, despite what some companies are still trying to achieve, which is, you know, retinal displays and, you know, higher and higher pixel count, et cetera, um, those are going down, I think, a you know, hardcore gamer sort of uh, yeah. experience and mentality. Yeah. And that's that is a tough nut to crack. Um, yeah. Gaming experiences by you know professional teenagers that are you know spending hours and hours. Um, that's a that's a sophisticated and I don't mean to you know down talk well, that whatsoever. You know the keyboard, the mouse, that interface is um, highly evolved with for playing you know fast paced um, articulated games and and VR for its um, nature of interface through using using the body is, you know, got inherently the problems that we have with with the body. And in some ways, the gaming industry has evolved past that. So, Andy, thanks for helping us take a deep dive uh, into these technologies. This is fascinating. Good talking. Thanks, Mark.